We've been looking at the life of David. If you want to open your Bibles up, we are going to be in 2 Samuel, the 12th chapter. 2 Samuel 12. And we're in the segment of, it, of David's life, or looking at the outline from the power uh, lectureships in South Haven, Georgia, on David's life, and are looking at the segment in the outline of David a committed, or excuse me, David a companion, a committed heart. And we're looking at some of David's companions. And last week we looked at Jonathan, and Jonathan was that companion that supported David. He was there for David. And we need friends like Jonathan. But tonight we turn our attention to another friend of Daniel of David and his name is Nathan we need friends like Nathan as well and I believe Jonathan was a sincere and honest friend and I think Jonathan would have told David when he was wrong he was that kind of friend and true loyalty I think is there but Nathan is the friend in David's life the friend in inspired text that gives us that example who loved his friend enough to tell him the truth. Who loved his friend enough to tell him the truth. We need friends that support us. We need friends that support us when we're wrong. But we need friends who support us when we're wrong in such a way that they help us to be better or to be right. I tell my kids all the time that if you needed just people to agree with you, you wouldn't need people at all. You already have yourself. And so having friends who are willing to speak up, friends who are willing to give constructive criticism, now that's an art all of itself, right? Destruction is easy. Construction is difficult. But friends who give constructive criticism. What we also see in this 12th chapter we're going to look at momentarily is that even in David's darkest hour, and we are looking at David's darkest hour, he was a great man. He was a great man. Because great man can make horrendous decisions. But David's heart, when he's confronted, and his reaction when he was faced with his sin, is honorable. And I think that's something worth noting. Now, Nathan, a friend who loved enough to tell the truth, predisposer presumes that we have the knowledge of David's sin, of Bathsheba. David commits adultery with Bathsheba and conceives a child. And David's a little bit like we are in our society today. The sin was adultery. The sin is fornication. It's a child <laughs> that seems to get the attention. And David responds in a similar way to what we see in our society a lot of times today. David needs to cover his sin up. And there's no doubt his sin needs hid. But David goes about it in a way, hiding his sin, very different than what he explains in many of his psalms. David writes, blessed is he whom God hides his sin, but David dug his own grave and pushed not his sin but Uriah into it because after failing to get Uriah to be with his wife so that Uriah might falsely believe that the child was his he sends Uriah into the most dangerous place not just the most dangerous but has the general Joab send him into a place that he knows is going to be overcome by the enemy and Uriah, not just Uriah, a couple dozen others die with him. 
And so, at the end of chapter 11 of 2 Samuel, verse 26 of chapter 11, 2 Samuel reads, When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. And I know there's one more sentence in it's an important sentence. But if we pause right there, David, he felt, I'm sure, wow, that was a near miss. That's a near miss. But it's all taken care of now. But the last sentence of chapter 11 reads, But the thing that David did, it displeased the Lord. The thing that David did, it displeased the Lord. And that is the platform on which chapter 12 is built. Before we look at Nathan, if you would read with me, it's just a handful of verses here, starting in verse 1 of chapter 12. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and he said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he bought it up, and he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsels and drink from his cup, and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come in to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Verse 7. I'm sure you could feel the tension in the room at this point. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anoint you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you displeased the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Amorites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun for you did it secretly but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun David verse 13 said to Nathan I have sinned against the Lord and Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. Just as a side note before we get into the lesson, I think Nathan's description here is nothing short of of incredible. The whole discourse is incredible. But verse 14, Nathan says to David, you have scorned the Lord. You have scorned the Lord. What a horrible thing to have taken place. Nathan, a friend 
who loved enough to tell the truth. Now here in chapter 12, we see that the very first phrase that is in this chapter is the Lord sent Nathan to David. The Lord sent Nathan to David. We'll start by looking at Nathan's position. Nathan was a spokesperson. Nathan's first introduced in scripture in the seventh chapter of this book. And there he is described as a prophet. Nathan, the prophet. A prophet was one who literally interpreted seas. One who sees. One who speaks for God. Elsewhere in scripture, we would see them labeled as a minister, a servant of God, a man of God. Peter would have us know that these individuals were inspired, meaning they moved by the Spirit of God. In short, Nathan's doing this because it's God's work. <laughs> I just wonder how much God told Nathan. I have my suspicions. If, if we read it just on its face value, notice this, that the Lord says to Nathan, you go. And then the Lord tells David what the judgment is, why he's in trouble and what the judgment is. But we don't read that the Lord told Nathan what to say. <laughs> in my mind, I picture Nathan the night before scratching his head <laughs> saying, boy, how am I going to handle this? I don't know if you've ever been around someone that likes confrontation. <laughs> That's a person to avoid. Nathan was likely sick to his stomach. But he's going to speak for the Lord. <clears throat> I gave the description earlier of what a prophet is. And I think that we could more generalize for our purposes tonight and say a prophet in the sense of what we're looking at tonight is one whom the Spirit of the Lord sits upon. One who has God's Spirit. What's interesting to me about Nathan is he not only says what God would have him to say, but as I mentioned, we really don't know whether God told him exactly what to say or not, but everything he says and the way he says it shows the Spirit of God. You know, we're looking at Nathan, we're looking at David, and we're making observations about the past, but they wouldn't be any good for us if we didn't apply them. I think there's an obvious answer or uh, lesson, excuse me, as we go throughout tonight that we have to ask ourselves is, when I do wrong, do I have the same attitude that David has? That's an obvious one. Here's a more difficult question, I think. When my friend does wrong, do I have the kind of attitude and spirit that Nathan has? Or maybe another question would be, do I have the Spirit of the Lord? I don't necessarily mean inspired. But Scripture talks throughout the New Testament, Galatians, the fifth chapter, you know, we're, we're so familiar with the fruits of the Spirit but that whole chapter, second half of that chapter at least, is talking about being led by the Spirit. If we are led by the Spirit of God, we're going to act like Nathan did. Nathan was led to confront his friend. He was led to confront him in a godly way. I think there's some 
observations that we could make. In fact, the author, the outline I looked at had nine observations. I found a few of them in my estimation to be redundant, so I'll hone them down. Amanda likes to hear when I shorten things. She didn't like to hear when I lengthen my lessons. But these observations can certainly be made about the prophets of the Old and New Testament. I think they should be observations of you and I, of Christians today. That Nathan, certainly, and the prophets in general were uncompromising. Public opinion didn't affect what they taught. Was Nathan worried about how David reacted? I think everything that he said and how he said it says he did. You know, sometimes we hear uncompromising that if public opinion doesn't matter as though that doesn't matter how we say things. How's that work at home? Corey, do you, ever, do you ever have a desire for things to be a little bit different at home than they are? In small issues? Yeah. Does it matter how you approach that topic? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, Christian, I don't know where he gets this, but he's a button pusher. <laughs> he must get that from his mother, right? He went, that has nothing to do with me. Uh, Amanda buys, tends to buy juices in bulk, and I mean, I've got, she's always got juice at the house. We drink a lot of juice, and it's always there. The last couple of times she went to the store, she bought light grape juice. Light grape juice. Now, that's something she's prone to doing, is buying light this, light that. I, I don't know what your opinion on skim milk is, but I tell her, why don't you buy the whole milk? I'll drink that. When you want some milk, you just water it down. So she bought light grape juice. I walked in. I said, hey, hon, when you go back to the store, because I wouldn't try and complain, but man, that grape juice really was no good. <laughs> I said, would you mind buying the stuff with, you know, the grape juice with the good stuff in it? She said, so are you asking me to buy wine? No, no, no. I mean the sugar in it. You know, the, the grape, the actual grape. You know, the, not all the good stuff's taken out of it. I'd have been okay. She said, oh, I'd have bought that by accident. But Christian, and I don't see him poking his head over the monitor at the moment, but Christian went to poking. Yeah, Mom, you seem to do that a lot. And he just kept at it until her face turned red. They said, son, shut up. Right? It makes a difference how we approach things. Notice, and we'll talk in a little more detail about how Nathan approached this. But he was uncompromising. He's going to get the truth across. Public opinion doesn't matter in that way. But he's concerned to how David reacts. That's different than being uncompromising or that's different than compromising secondly he was conscious of being called to the task Nathan was conscious of being called to the task the Lord sent Nathan to David in other words Nathan knew that the Lord was displeased with what David did. And Nathan knew it was his job to go to David. Are there any times in your life when you're conscious of being called to the task? But maybe you don't want to go do it? I'll bet you this was on the list for Nathan. You know, sometimes we assume that just because he did it, that he was comfortable with it. He was conscious of being called to the task. Follow that up with, I've told this story before about the trainer who 
had to let his apprentice go for having too good of eyesight. He sat him down, he had a talk with him. He said, after being with me for three years, you should see what needs to be done next. He said, Mike, I had to fire him. He had good eyesight. So what do you mean? He said, after I gave him that lecture, he walked in, he told my wife a list of things that need done at the barn. He could see just fine. Right? Sometimes we can intentionally be blind to the task. He was conscious of being called to the cat task. He was backed by the authority of God. I think that's a necessity. You might say, well, that's obvious. Sometimes we can get a little bit ahead of ourselves. Nathan was backed by the authority of God. He was standing on truth. Nathan was a spokesperson. He went to David and he told him what needed done. That was Nathan's position as a prophet. But what about Nathan's presentation? It was a story. It was a story. I think Nathan knew he had to be wise because David hadn't asked for him. You know, I think there's a lot of wisdom in the statement that you should wait to give advice Till you're asked for it. That's the advice even then sometimes it's, <laughs> you know, disliked. David hasn't asked for the advice. David hasn't asked for Nathan's opinion on the topic. How do you think this would have went if Nathan, and we're surmising, if Nathan walks up to the palace and he says, you know what, David, you're a murderous, adulterous individual and you deserve to die. I don't mean to imply that John the Baptist was wrong or didn't handle things, not at all. But John the Baptist was imprisoned and ultimately beheaded for a lot less. Nathan responds with wisdom. Wisdom. By telling a story, he allows David to Evaluate without emotion. Maybe another way of looking at it, it's easier to see someone else's sin than your own. <laughs> he, he takes all the, the defense mechanisms, he takes all the emotion, he takes all the things that might clutter David's response, and he appeals solely to David's civil responsibility. He responds with wisdom. Secondly, his presentation was full of courage. He risked their friendship. He risked being arrested. He risked his own life. He responded wisely, but he responded with courage. And he responded with respect. Respect. Who read, David, did you read our, our uh, scripture reading from Galatians, the sixth chapter? Galatians, the sixth chapter, talks about going to the one 
who's caught in a transgression. Verse 1 says, Brother, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watching yourself lest you be tempted. <laughs> I think a lot of times that's presented as though you might be tempted with the sin that the individual's caught up in. Nathan was under no risk of being caught up in the temptation that David was caught up in. But was he at risk of being caught up in the sin of arrogance? Absolutely. Was he at risk of being caught up in the sin of being judgmental? Absolutely. You know, people say to me, no one has the right to judge me. And Christians yell back, yes, I do. <laughs> In some regards, they're right. Nathan's approach here is not condescending. It's not belittling to the character of David. And immediately, he says, the Lord has covered your sin. Now, he couldn't say that if he wasn't backed, as we have noted, by the authority of God. I don't mean you, and I hope not me. But how common is it today for people just to heap on? To kick an individual while they're down, so to speak. We talked about Nathan's wisdom as he approached the topic. How it would have, the lack of wisdom likely would have changed the outcome. I think keeping on or not being respectful would have changed it as well. Nathan went with it, to him with the spirit of gentleness. If you would, though, and it's a few months since we read it, so look at verse 5 and 6. Notice David's own pronouncement. And isn't it interesting that Nathan, in his wisdom, gets David to make the pronouncement of guilt. David says, David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. <laughs> Number one, David's response is just. It's based on the law. Now, I misunderstood this much of my life to think that David pronounces him to death. He does not. He says the man deserves to die. He will repay fourfold. That was according to the law. David makes a just response. David, David's response is fair. Notice something though. David makes comment on the man's character, doesn't he? He had no pity. He's at least talking about that situation. What's David saying? He never looked at the situation from the poor man's perspective. Whose eyes do you think David had never used? Uriah's. He sure used his own. But it wasn't Uriah's that he used. David pronounces the man guilty. That was Nathan's presentation. Nathan's practical application starts in verse 7. With, in the original language, just three words. In ours, four words. You are the man. You are the man. 
You know what's interesting? David says this man deserves to die. And I think we can all relate to what he's saying. But stealing, as this rich man did, was not a capital offense. The offense would have included him paying back fourfold what he took. You know what was a capital offense? Adultery. At this moment, I believe David understood exactly what he'd done. Nathan rebukes David's ingratitude. He says, the Lord had given you Saul's kingdom. He gave you his household. He gave you the entire nation and would have given you all the more had you asked. You have everything and then abounding. And your actions show in gratitude. You never... You've never been there before, have you? Your sinful action has never been a sign of ingratitude, I'm sure. Nathan refused his punishment. It's amazing to me how oftentimes people say David got away with this. Oh, God, God overlooks, you know, for David. What? No, he did not. Look in verse 10. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite as a wife. You know, David was used to fighting enemies and he did it almost his entire life. I don't think that wore on David near like when the sword and the enemies were within his own house. Nathan says, the sword will never depart from your house. Thus says the Lord, because I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. You Weeks ago, we studied that when Absalom chases him out of the kingdom under the advisement of Othophel, which we're going to look at, Lord willing, next week, he takes David's wives on top of the palace, likely the very same spot that David spotted Bathsheba from, and lies with them. David, what you've done in secret will be done to you in the open. I think this is telling as well about God's punishment. It, we kind of touched on there, I touched on this this morning about our purpose in life. And why we serve God and, and why we do the things we do. And I hinted at the idea of why God gives us the commands he did. These punishments, with the exception of his son dying, which is part of the punishment, are things that would have naturally happened from David's sin. He very naturally undermines his own family life. Deteriorates the family structure by what he does. Secondly, he deteriorates the civil regard of the nation. It's not without relevance that the nation doesn't survive but one more king. These are natural responses and consequences of sin. But moving on, Nathan received... His confession, David said, I have sinned before the Lord. And he reminded David of his covering. He says, you shall not die. There's so much to be said here about our God, right? 
you know, people get wound up. God let David get away with this. I am grateful, grateful that I serve a God that is forgiving and merciful. Because as David understood after pronouncing judgment on another, I need mercy, I need grace. And the main theme of this chapter is if we turn to God, there's grace, there's mercy available to us. Lastly and shortly, I want to note Nathan's overall performance. It leaves a statement for us today. A friend who loved enough to tell his friend the truth. Now, there are individuals, there are friends who can confront people. There are friends who can tell the truth. There are friends who can tell hard sayings. But it's noteworthy that Nathan loved God and his fellow man enough to speak the truth. His performance is an example of love. An example of wisdom it's an example of gentleness, and yet an example of forgiveness, or firmness, I mean to say. And it's an example of God's forgiveness. We serve a great God. He's worth serving, even when it's difficult. May Nathan's example of a committed friend who loved enough to tell the truth inspire us to lovingly and gently share the truths of Christ for the saving purpose they are meant to serve. If this evening you serve any other, I encourage you to come forward and make that confession to help us know how we can aid you in your spiritual walk. If you're subject to the gospel call, please come forward as together we stand and sing.